Hello, uh, good evening to everybody and be very welcome to this uh, joint together from ESU and ESGURS. Uh, it is my honor and my pleasure to be here today with uh, this panel of experts that uh, we are going to uh, speak and to clarify the management of uh, genital trauma. Genital trauma, it is a very rare condition. It is something that uh, it is not very frequently happening, but when it happens, it is really important to know how to manage it, uh, just to avoid not only in the acute phase, uh, the, the effects of the trauma, but also in the medium and in the long term uh, to avoid complications. For that issue today, we have a panel of experts, international experts, uh, Dr. Uh, Tamsin Greenwell from London. She's going to speak about urethral trauma. Uh, then Dr. Garcia Cruz is going to speak us about the penile uh, fracture. Uh, Dr. Georgievic is going to speak about the dramatic penile amputation. And finally, Dr. Redmond is going to speak us about testicular trauma. So thank you to all of us. Thank you for the European Urological Association for giving us this platform to share uh, our knowledge and to spread it to all the people that is with us. And directly I gave uh, the word uh, to Tamsim. Thank you for being with us. Tamsim, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for asking me to talk to you today <coughs> on uh, the management of urethral trauma. The urethral trauma can occur anywhere along the urethra. Blunt trauma is the commonest cause in both the posterior urethra, where it's almost exclusively due to pelvic fracture, and the bulbar urethra, where it's mainly caused by fall astride or kicks to the perineum. Penetrating trauma from knife, gunshot or shrapnel is very rare. Iatrogenic urethral injury, most commonly related to urethral catheter, is the commonest form of injury of the urethra and occurs in 13 out of every thousand men having an indwelling urethral catheter inserted. Female urethral injury is very rare and is mainly a consequence of pelvic fracture. The incidence of pelvic fracture is about 20 per 100,000 for men and 29 per 100,000 for women. 90% of patients with pelvic fractures have significant associated injuries including close head injury, chest, abdomen, and limb injury. The majority of pelvic fractures are caused by road traffic accidents with falls and crush injuries uh, constituting mostly the remainder. The three most commonly used orthopedic pel pelvic fracture classifications are young burgers, tile, and the AOOTA. They all stem from the 1990 young Burgess classification shown in the slide, which is based on the mechanism of injury and associated injuries. And their lateral compression with a side swipe push of the affected side towards the opposite side, anterior posterior compression fractures, which result in an open book pelvis type fracture, and vertical shear in which one or both sides are displaced in the vertical plane. Uh, pelvic fracture injuries are, that cause pelvic fracture urethral injuries are always high impact injuries with significant mortality rates. And immediate management should be aimed at stabilization of the patient and assessment and treatment of life and limb threatening injuries. Pelvic fracture urethral injury can be partial or complete disruption of the urethra. In the acute situation, a urethral injury should be suspected uh, if there's blood at the meatus, if there's difficulty or inability to void, if there's a palpable bladder or a high riding prostate and or a pelvic fracture with displacement of the pubic rami. Butterfly bruising is shown in, in this slide is due to hematoma confined by colleagues fascia and, and it's often a late finding and indicates rupture of the perineal membrane. Classical findings may be absent in up to 75% of patients, but suspicion should be maintained. Even with these findings, it's not unreasonable to have one gentle attempt at catheterization urethrally. Uh, the fear that urethral catheterization might convert a partial to a complete fracture, um, complete um, tear, is unrealistic, especially as urethral catheter passes easily into the bladder in about 50% of patients with a partial injury. 
If catheterization isn't possible in a stable patient, urethrography, retrograde and antigrade is the gold standard for diagnosis. It's usually performed with 20 to 30 mils of water-soluble contrast media uh, using an aseptic technique uh, with intravenous antibiotic cover to avoid infecting the fracture hematoma. Uh, the best images are obtained with the patient in a 20 to 30 degree oblique position Extravation of the contrast from the bladder without filling of the bladder is interpreted as showing complete disruption. Extravasation of contrast from the urethra with partial filling of the bladder is interpreted as showing partial disruption. If the patient remains relatively unstable, uh, then they should have urinary diversion with a suprapubic catheter or an attempt made at primary endoscopic realignment, uh, provided that this doesn't interfere with the, or delay resuscitation um, and treatment of associated injuries. Uh, endoscopic realignment can be performed by antigrade and retrograde catheter insertion over a guide wire um, inserted at flexible cystoscopy or via a rendezvous procedure. Most rendezvous procedures involve passing a full French ureteric catheter or guide wire antigradely via the suprapubic tract um, through the lumen of a Goodwin sound or a cystoscope um, that can then be retrieved uh, by a second cystoscope with a second operator in the distal urethra. It's then used as a guide to pass the 18 to 20 silicon catheter fairly into the bladder. This technique can also be performed in the early post-pelvic fracture patient uh, as it's a way of ridding the patient of their suprapubic catheter uh, in a more timely manner. Overall, the literature indicates a restrictor rate of between 10 and 100%, ballpark figure about 58%. Uh, one study with long-term follow-up over five years shows a restrictor rate of about 40%. Overall, between zero and 100% of patients, that's about 23% overall, had erectile dysfunction following this um, type of management, and about 4% with a range of 0 to 20% had urinary incontinence. Primary endoscopic uh, realignment uh, becomes, as it becomes more popular, there's an increasing number of uh, series of delayed ure urethroplasty in the literature following realignment. And there's no real consensus as to whether this uh, benefits or hinders uh, the eventual outcomes, uh, with some series plotting stricture-free rates of urethroplasty after failed realignment of six to 76 to 90 percent, uh, with others as low as 43 percent. If primary realignment fails, uh, then you can try an early bulboprostatic urethroplasty. Um, there's limited data, but it suggests that in the index patient, which is a patient who's able to be positioned in lithotomy, has a short urethral defect, a soft perineum is stable, um, may provide early resolution of uh, the stricture uh, and has similar outcomes to delayed BPA. Uh, delayed BPA urethroplasty has an overall 86% stricture free rate. Um, with less than 5% incidence of new onset erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence. And uh, fortuitously, up to 20% of men will recover their erectile function after surgery. Um, this is the first step of a progressive bulboprostatic anastomotic urethroplasty, showing transection of the urethra uh, through the stricture and then mobilization of the bulb to the level of the suspensory ligament. Uh, this shows uh, that the proximal scar tissue has been excised um, around the proximal urethra and the proximal urethra widely spatulated. This shows um, if, the, you, if you require extra length, the defect is quite large, uh, then you can gain additional length by midline separation of the crura uh, to deepen the groove and then progress to an inferior pubectomy shown on the left. And if necessary, in less than 6% of patients, you can transpose the distal part of the urethra and corpus spongiosum uh, under the crura. The EAU guidelines on posterior urethral management basically say the same in an unstable patient, divert, um, consider when they become a bit more stable endoscopic realignment in a stable patient, if they've got absolute indications for operation, bladder injury, bladder, bladder neck injury, rectal injury, then immediate repair. Otherwise, one can consider early endoscopic realignment, early repair or delayed repair, depending on the uh, skill set available. If we move on to anterior urethral injuries, 
um, if they're traumatic, like in penile fracture uh, related urethral injuries, uh, as shown above in this patient, uh, then immediate exploration and diversions indicated. Uh, however, blunt bulbar injuries can be treated with immediate or delayed bulbar bulbar and astomotic uh, repair with excellent outcomes. If delayed, uh, a suprapubic is often required. Uh, for a crush injury to the urethral bulb, a transection technique is required for the bulbo bulbar anastomosis in order to excise the scar tissue rather than a non-transecting. And you can see in this slide, uh, transection of the urethra through the occlusive uh, scar tissue, mobilization proximally to the level of the uh, suspensory ligament and then uh, anastomosis, taking uh, sutures through the overlying corpus cavernosus to ensure it's widely spat spatulated and stabilized. If the distance is too uh, big, uh, too large to broach, once you've excised the scar tissue, you can perform an augmented uh, bulbo bulbar anastomotic urethroplasty uh, with uh, uh, excellent outcomes. Uh, the EAU guidelines on anterior urethral stricture disease uh, basically uh, concur with this pathway and would suggest that if you have an iatrogenic, a blunt partial injury uh, or a, a, a stable penetrating injury, uh, then you can think about urinary diversion uh, and delayed repair if required. If you have a complete blunt injury, a penile fracture injury, and a penetrating injury in a stable patient, uh, then you should uh, think about immediate repair. Uh, as I said before, female pelvic urethral injuries are mostly related to female pelvic fractures, and they're extremely rare until you get older, when you get isolated pelvic fracture injuries that don't affect the urethra in general. Early realignment uh, in women uh, is associated with very high stricture rates, as shown in the table, uh, and incontinence. Uh, late repair, if treated with simple uh, urinary diversion initially, uh, can be very challenging and is associated with extensive abdominovaginal uh, mobilization. Uh, this is a lady who was uh, referred to me with a, uh, who'd initially been diverted after her pelvic fracture urethral injury. And she uh, basically had a completely closed off bladder neck and had lost three centimeters of her urethra with just the distal half a centimeter left. Uh, this is a suprapubic cystotomy to identify where the bladder neck is. Uh, suprapubic cystoscopy, sorry. Um, this was used to guide a needle in through the bladder neck, and which was followed by uh, closely by a knife in order to open up the bladder neck. This was then widened and a new open neo bladder neck opening created, which was attached to a vaginal flap uh, to give her a urethroplasty uh, and a, a functioning urethra, which was surprisingly relatively continent. If we look at the EAU guidelines in terms of overall management of urethral trauma, then they advocate for appropriate training um, of personnel to avoid catheter damage, uh, which makes sense uh, that we should uh, diagnose urethral uh, injuries with flexible cystoscopy or retrograde urethrography uh, in uh, both uh, in men and in women with uh, cystoscopy and vaginoscopy. Uh, that anterior urethral injuries, uh, which are iatrogenic, should be managed with urinary diversion. Uh, that partial blunt anterior urethral injuries should also be managed with uh, uh, urinary diversion. Uh, that you can consider treating a complete blunt anterior urethral injury uh, with immediate surgical repair. Uh, pelvic fracture urethral injuries uh, in hemodynamically, patient, hemodynamically unstable patients uh, should be managed with urinary diversion. Uh, early endoscopic realignment in a stable patient can be trialed. Uh, repeat endoscopic treatments for pelvic fracture urethral injuries shouldn't be trialed. The uh, partial posterior urethral injury should be managed initially by suprapubic or transurethral catheterization as it may settle and require no further treatment. Um, immediate urethroplasty for pelvic fracture urethral injuries in men is contraindicated, uh, but early urethroplasty between two days and six weeks after the pelvic fracture injury is um, reasonable to trial in select patients. 
uh, that uh, complete di disruption can be managed initially safely with uh, urinary diversion and a delayed repair. Uh, however, in women, uh, one should try for early realignment. And then the final slide is my references. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Tamsin, for uh, this didactic uh, lecture. Uh, we are moving now to the next lecture. Uh, Dr. Garcia is going to speak about a uh, penile fracture, okay? Sorry. Um, what I've done has been uh, to review the literature uh, for the last five years, uh, English language and uh, the first conclusion is that there is a scarce data covering penile fracture because it's a very uh, uncommon uh, disease. We only have a little bit more than 200 papers in the last five years. Um, uh, there's a, there's a meta-analysis uh, that was published by the group of Dr. David Ralph uh, some time ago, a couple of years ago, in which they were only able to join a little bit more than 400 um, penile fractures review, reviewing the whole literature. So that gives us the idea of how uncommon this situation is. And you see here, right-hand side, the uh, most common symptoms of men uh, with uh, penile fracture, penile hematoma, swelling, detumescence, typically related with this you know, popping sound. Uh, when we find urethral bleeding or acute urinary um, retention, it's likely that urethra will be involved. Uh, dealing with the etiology, it's, it's interesting to see that depending on the geographic area, um, the etiology of the penile fracture is different. So uh, those series, th those, uh, apps, those papers coming from Europe or, or America, the cause of the penile fracture was more likely to be intercourse, while uh, in those uh, experiences coming from, especially Northern Africa or Middle East, the caca and dan maneuver was more, more common. Although uh, some uh, etiologies, some causes of uh, penile fracture have been described, such as during masturbation or rolling over in the bed with uh, penis in the erect state, but much, much less um, common. Uh, how could we reach a diagnose? Well, the clinic is uh, usually very uh, explicit. Um, ultrasound has been widely spread for, for a while. So uh, it's very, uh, it, most of the uh, serious use uh, penile ultrasound. Some of them have used cavernosography. Uh, MRI has very good, um, both sensitivity and specificity. Um, and as, as, uh, as long as we, widespread the use in, of MRI in the, uh, in the ER, I guess we'll have more data, but uh, MRI looks like a very promising tool. But I have to say there's some, some data showing that when we have urethral involvement in the penile fracture, the, the um, figures of the MRI, the, uh, both sensitivity and specificity go down dramatically. So we should be a little bit more careful with the results of the MRI when we uh, suspect uh, urethral involvement in the pineal fracture. And dealing on how to explore the urethra, and this, uh, this uh, slide shows it, when we go to the EAU guidelines, what we find is that um, cystoscopy, cystoscopy is preferable to um, urethrogram because it uh, has better uh, sensitivity and specificity. And that's uh, a good uh, take home message to try to use uh, cystoscopy, have the cystoscopy prepared in the OR if we suspect that the penal fracture may involve uh, urethra. Um, so now what I've done has been to review the papers in which they were wondering which one was the best approach for, for a long time, maybe uh, 80 years, something like that. Uh, some centers were offering uh, observation and I will show you three papers in which the design is very, uh, very akin. Um, they offered surgery for everybody. And for those men who rejected surgery, they, um, they uh, grouped these men in the treatment group surgery versus the observation group. And you can see here that 
those gentlemen skipping surgery were at much higher risk of having erectile dysfunction uh, post fracture. The same here in this paper published in uh, Korean Journal of Urology, uh, very, uh, very same conclusion. Those men um, treated with conservative treatment did much worse in terms of you know, penile deviation, erectile dysfunction, pain on erection, et cetera, et cetera. And same, um, same outcome in this Turkish paper in which they find the very same conclusion. So although this, uh, this retrospective and uh, not very good quality data because of the nature of the penile fracture itself, but I think this, this question of expectation versus surgical treatment is, uh, is, is solved. All the data points in the same direction that we should be uh, advising uh, these men to undergo surgery. Next question would be delayed versus um, immediate uh, surgery. Some time ago, Dr. Romero and uh, myself, as members of the Yao Men's Health Group, we, we did our, uh, our, we review the penile fractures of uh, many, many centers in Europe. And what we found was that um, delaying the uh, surgery was related with first month erectile dysfunction and third month erectile dysfunction. And what we found was that uh, we, we draw like a, a, a line in which those men who uh, underwent surgery less than eight hours after the penal fracture did much better than those in which the surgery was delayed for more um, than, than these eight hours. Um, very same uh, conclusion here. This is um, a Qatari paper uh, in which they, um, again, they group patients in uh, depending on the delay of the surgery. And what they found was that in those men um, who were treated early, only 5% of them had erectile uh, dysfunction, whilst in those men with uh, delayed surgery, 18% of them ended up having uh, erectile dysfunction. And it, uh, they, interestingly, they performed uh, uh, duplex ultrasound and they found venous leakage, not, surpri not surprisingly, but they found uh, venous leakage as, as the entity responsible, responsible for this uh, erectile dysfunction. Uh, dealing with the surgical approach and the findings we may um, find in the, in the surgery, uh, both coronal incision and ventral penoscrotal incision have been used. Some, uh, some uh, authors uh, advocate for combined incision, but really there's no good data um, uh, showing which one uh, we could use. I, the, most of the, no, not most, all the uh, penile fractures I have uh, operated, I use the coronal incision. I, I, I've never had any uh, issue with a skin necrosis or neurovascular bundle lesion. Uh, but I, some of my fellows have used, uh, again, ventral penoscrotal incision with, with good results. So I guess that's a matter of, of the surgeon's uh, choice. Um, dealing with the operatory field, uh, unilateral fractures are mal, much more likely than bilateral. Right corpus cavernosum, um, interesting, the, uh, the uh, fracture uh, is more common than left cor cor corpora cavernosa. And mid shaft and proximal uh, penis uh, fractures are much uh, like li much more likely than than distal um, fractures, and as, as I was commenting before, urethral involvement uh, appears in fifteen percent of of all these penile fractures. So it's something that we should bear in mind when we go to the surgery. And as uh, there's shown in the EAU, EAU guidelines, uh, looks like a good idea to have a flexible cystoscopy or a or cystoscopy during the surgery in case we have to assess the urethra. Uh, dealing with surgical technique, I found this, this paper in which mainly what the conclusions are that uh, there's a huge variability amongst uh, different series, uh, uh, slow reabsorbable or uh, reabsorbable um, uh, stitches, uh, especially uh, interrupted, but some other uh, surgeons are using uh, running sutures have been uh, tried. There's really no good data comparing which um, approach is, is better. Uh, and when we go to the urethra, and for, for some time there was, there was controversy on if um, 
if uh, the urethra should be, uh, if we should place a, a vesical catheter or for how long, et cetera. And when we go to the EAU guidelines, what we find is that um, we should divert urine for, for at least two, three weeks um, in case we suspect or we find um, urethral um, affect, uh, the urethra is affected uh, by the penile fracture. Um, and this is one of my last slides. Uh, what, what happens with Peyronie and penile fracture? Uh, this is uh, a paper from, the Wayne, from Wayne Hellstrom's group in which what they did was review the literature of uh, men treated with uh, Peyronie and the possibility of these men of developing penile fracture. And the figures are this one. Um, more or less the, the risk is 0.5%. Uh, traditionally, we andrologists or, or urologists uh, more focused on, on sexual medicine have been taught that these fractures only occur in, in the two week period after the injection, but this has uh, shown to be not always the case. There are some data showing that some of these fractures might, uh, might appear um, later. Um, and in this, this a very interesting paper in which uh, in the SMN, SMSNA, um, there was a, a survey amongst um, professionals, uh, uh, highly skilled professionals on, on uh, Peyroni. In what, what they did was they, they asked this, the audience um, if, they had pay, if they had a fracture following Peyroni and most of them said they, they faced that situation. Uh, what did they do? And uh, surprisingly, something like 70% uh, of them advised for surgery, but 30% of, of, uh, of these professionals um, advised for conservative treatment. And the results um, didn't differ, or, or so was the opinion of the, of the experts. Um, those who advocate for surgery said that the uh, quality of the tissue was very poor, that it was very complicated to you know, place the stitches and do the, the reparation of the penile fracture. And that was um, one like reason to, um, in some cases, um, advice for conservative treatment in, the, in, um, in patients after Peyronie's treatment. Um, here, uh, Hellstrom again uh, advises for for a careful uh, consideration of the pros and cons, as you know, these are very this this retrospective data and secondhand data. So, um, but I guess as the nature of the fracture in uh, regular penile fracture or a peyronie are completely different, and you know that in, in a, after a peyronie treatment, we will find the fracture will be 100% in the um, in the plaque, uh, maybe. Uh, in some cases, it could be uh, feasible to to advise for uh, for conservative uh, treatment. And this is my uh, my take home message slide: diagnose uh, ultrasound uh, and or MRI as long as we have uh, it available in the in the emergency room. Plus cystoscopy if we think that the urethra is uh, involved in the fracture. Non delayed surgery less than eight hours looks like a very good uh, option. Both coronal and penoscrotal incision are um, good options. There's no data um, on which one is, is preferable. 50% uh, of the men will have urethral involvement and we should leave a catheter there for two weeks. Uh, we don't have good data on which is the surgical technique, which is the ideal stitch or the uh, technical um, stitching technique we should be using, and maybe Peyroni uh, or fracture in um, in a Peyroni uh, patient uh, is a is a bird of a of a different feather, as the fracture will be uh, localized in the plaque with poor tissue, and in some of these um, gentlemen, a conservative treatment could be an option. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for your uh, very didactic and clear presentation. Now we are moving uh, to a dramatic scenario. It's a dramatic penal amputation. Dr. Georgievic is going to present us 
uh, this uh, extremely strange uh, scenario, but for sure, uh, really interesting. Please go ahead. Thank you. Dear friends, <clears throat> good evening from Belgrade. I am going to show you something about my experience in the management of a very difficult uh, scenario that is uh, something like uh, uh, a very, very difficult um, uh, traumatic penal amp amputation. So, penal amputation is a very rare penal injury. Why? Because the penis is very good protected with a flexible anatomy, very elastic, especially if we have a flaccid and uh, erectile state. And according to this, uh, we don't have too much uh, reports about uh, um, penal trauma, especially penal amputation. Type and also um, clinical presentation of penal trauma varies. And uh, we are going today to discuss about individual approaches and about the uh, uh, very rare, very rare cases. And about the, the cause, uh, we know that um, penal amputation and very severe penal trauma always result in very difficult psychological and psychosexual problem to our patients. So if we don't have unique therapeut uh, therapeutic management, our experience is here to leading us to uh, offer the best possible option for our clients. I put here on this slide some of the causes, something about tra uh, traumatic amputation that could be uh, partial or complete. Then I put a different, different um, uh, reasons for, uh, for um, penal amputation. Something about strategy of trauma, according to the American Society for uh, Surgeon Trauma, uh, we have uh, several uh, grades of uh, this injury. We have uh, five grades and uh, the worst scenario is a uh, grade number five, that is a total penectomy. One of the first options that we can offer to our clients is a uh, reimplantation of the amputated penis, but it is uh, related uh, to uh, it is related to the uh, time between the injury and uh, a possible treatment. Usually, we can do this in the first twenty-four hours, but I think it is almost possible in the first eight to tw to uh, twelve hours. If it is possible to do, we are going to uh, rejoin both corporal cavernosa to make urethral retrostomy and then to try to uh, make a microvascular anastomosis and to um, uh, replace uh, all injured uh, parts of neurovascular bundle to be normal. I put here some of the some of the cases. Uh, one of the cases you can see here: penis is completely um, um, destroyed. And uh, in this case, we completely um, reconstructed this, but the result is, as you can see here, very poor. We have a penis, but it is with the smaller uh, uh, dimensions and uh, uh, with a very, very, very um, bad appearance. In a delayed reconstruction, we have uh, plenty of options. In a partial amputation, we can do reconstruction just of the missing parts. If for this reason, we use different uh, uh, genital flaps or some uh, grafts like oral uh, mucosa grafts. Also, we can um, um, take a care of reconstruction of the glands, of the lengthening of the penis that we have to uh, restore the length of the penis before trauma. One of the difficult care parts is also urethral reconstruction. Uh, we heard before uh, about this. And uh, finally, in a total amputation, we have a, just two options. One is a phalloplast, and another one is that I hope it will be a near future penile transplantation. You can see is now some of the cases. You can see here uh, glands reconstruction after amputation. In this case, we use the skin grafts and buccal mucosa grafts to completely reconstruct the missed uh, glands. In a delayed uh, um, repair, you can see here uh, that the penis is completely uh, covered, uh, trapped into the some remnants of the penile skin. And in this case, we completely reconstructed the, uh, the penis, created the urethra at the top, and uh, the, due to a using of some scrotal flaps, we did also bilateral orchiopexy. Another case, since there was no enough material, you can see here delayed reconstruction, small penis, we lengthen the penis completely, and then we use the two stages. In the first stage, we put the penal body, lengthened penal body, into the scrotal skin, and later we detach this to create a normal size and functioning penis. In a complete amputation, we have a um, 
complete uh, very huge problem. So in the, on this way, we are going to do, as I told you before, total uh, phalloplasty or um, in the future, maybe penal transplantation. In a total phalloplasty, we have uh, some goals, that is to, how to create a good volume of the neophallus, how to um, give a possibility to insert uh, uh, erectile de uh, devices uh, to uh, offer uh, erectile function, then to create a, a normal urethra, by, uh, to avoid while standing, and this is this procedure is always related as a multi-stage procedure. We have a various free flaps. Our uh, um, preference is using a platysmus dorsi flap. Something about a gold standard this is radial forearm flap, very well known in the last 34, five, uh, uh, 40 years. In this um, in this uh, surgery, we are going to use the. Uh, to, to use the skin as subcutaneous tissue from one of the arms. Another option is an uh, ALT flap from one of the of the buttocks. Also good option. Uh, you can see here one of the one of the cases. We lifted a, a good volume, good of the size of the flap based on the perforators uh, blood vessels, and then reconstruct the, the penis to have a good to have a good volume. You can see here a covering of the donor area. Our preference is Latissimus dorsi flap. We started to do the, uh, to use this flap um, more than 20 years, first in the pediatric population, uh, later in all cases who needs uh, phalloplasty. This is a multi-stage procedure. In the first stage, after complete reconstruction of neophallus, we use a stage buccal mucosa graft urethroplasty, uh, harvesting and um, uh, insertion, tubularization, and creation of urethra. For uh, erectile function, uh, we use uh, we use um, uh, erectile devices that is penile prosthesis, either uh, semi-rigid or um, inflatable penile prosthesis. Uh, approach could be infrapubic or ventral approach. And you can see here in one uh, case after phalloplasty, we use a, a posterior infrapubic approach. This is dilation with the uh, Hager dilators to create a two spaces like in, uh, in a two corpora cavernosa. And after that, we insert uh, two cylinders of inflatable penal prosthesis with a pump and a reservoir to give a good, to give a good uh, uh, erection, erectile function after reconstruction. A mailable is also possible, possible to put a little bit easier, dorsal approach. And this is a final result after phalloplasty with avoiding from the from the tip of the penis. In a penoscrotal approach, we are going to use a, a ventral approach, dilation by Hager, by Hagers, insertion of the malleable penile prosthesis, reconstruction of the glands, everything in one stage. In our cases, we published a very interesting study of 13 unusual cases a couple of years ago. And I will show you something of, uh, of this. This is one of the very rare cases due to hair strangulation of a mother of the kid. It was at the childhood. And later in uh, adult after puberty, we reconstructed this penis, gave a more volume, reconstructed the urethra. And this is the final approach, final appearance after this very strong, uh, very strong uh, uh, injury. This is one of the cases after for gangrene completely destroyed the penis and then reconstruction. And later he was a candidate for phalloplast. This is a very interesting case who lost a penis and the three fingers uh, during avoiding to a high voltage, um, uh, on high voltage. And we, in this case, we used the forearm, uh, the, the forearm flap. This is appearance after surgery. After that, we used the buccal mucosa graft first stage. After that, tubularization, insertion of semi-rigid prosthesis. And finally, we, uh, we changed semi-rigid prosthesis with the mailable to give this appearance of the penis. One of the uh, relatively often amputations, heterogenic amputations after failed epispadius repair. In this case, we uh, created the phallus using the latissimus dorsi flap, very long pedicle, microvascular anastomosis. And then you can see here good volume of the penis with the prosthesis. And you can see here also mitrophon of stoma, in this case, due to extrophy case. Uh, this is a very interesting case. He lost his penis during a failed uh, a curvature repair. In this case, we found the remnants of the corpor cavernosa used to put a malleable prosthesis and to cover with available skin. After that, we use the same procedure, you know, two stage buccal mucosa, uh, then a tubularization covering with a good scrotal flap and insertion of the penile prosthesis to give acceptable um, appearance and function of the penis. 
This is a penile amputation in a psychogenic patient, self-amputation. In this case, we used uh, our uh, latissimus dorsi flap. Reconstructing this penis, complete, penis completely. This is appearance after um, a couple months later, appearance of the um, donor site. And later, we used our two-stage procedure for urethra and insertion of the penile implants. Uh, finally, I think that uh, our future is related to the penile transplantation program. You know, we have today just four successful transplantation in, in the world. We started in a Belgrade to um, develop a technique how to do penile transplantation from live donor because we have a plenty of transgender uh, patients who are going to uh, for candidates for penile removal. So our idea is how to use the remnants of the penis and to offer uh, the, this uh, to clients who really needs a real, a real penis. This is uh, uh, some of the problems is bioethical, uh, lifelong immunosuppression therapy, possibilities of rejection, of course, uh, financial aspects and live donors. Our project is created to, uh, to, use, uh, to uh, develop a techniques on uh, 100 cadavers in a period of three years, and I hope that we will publish our first results very soon. In a conclusion, I would like to tell you that there is no general option how to uh, reconstruct the penis after, after total amputation. Today, we have a couple of options for phalloplasty. I'm not satisfied, and I hope that we together can uh, stray to make a better options and to try to find a better conditions for penile transplantation. At the end, I would like to wish you happy holidays and I hope to see you in person next year during our meeting in Milan in March. Uh, in March. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Georgievic, for this uh, uh, more than interesting and didactic uh, lecture. Uh, your experience is amazing. Thank you for sharing it with us. Finally, we are going uh, to speak about testicular trauma. Dr. Raymond, it's uh, more than welcome to be here. Thank you very much for your time and your... Okay, my speaker has gone mute, so I hope that everybody can hear me, but this is the last um, of our segments for the webinar, and this is the management of testicular trauma. Um, testicular trauma is relatively uncommon internationally, but in Ireland, um, we have a national sport called hurling, and uh, these men don't wear any kind of groin protection. So um, even though um, that is a surprising thing, unsurprisingly, um, it leads to a significant proportion of testicular injuries. The reason why blunt testicular trauma is uncommon is because of the relevant, uh, relative mobility of the testicle within the scrotum, the tough capsule of the tunica albuginea, and the protective reflex of the cremasteric muscle. When testicular injury does occur, um, it is usually due to uh, direct force to the scrotum, which causes compression of the testicle against the pubic bone. And this can result in a hematocele, which is a collection of blood between the two layers of tunica, an intratesticular hematoma or a collection of blood beneath the tunica albuginea or a testicular rupture where the tunica albuginea itself ruptures leading to extrusion of seminiferous tubules. Um, typically these men will present with pain, swelling and bruising of the scrotum and if a testicular injury is suspected um, then uh, the next step is to arrange a testicular ultrasound uh, this may show us in the top uh, photograph an ultrasound of an intratesticular hematoma, or in the bottom photograph, there is a hematocele and complete rupture of the testicle with um, extrusion of seminiferous tubules. The EAU and AUA guidelines, as we know, recommend urgent scrotal expiration in cases of suspected testicular rupture. And the EAU guidelines also recommend expiration where there's a hematocele greater than three times the size of the contralateral testes. And the reason for this is because studies show that in up to 80% of cases, there may be a testicular rupture beneath the hematocele, which isn't detected on an ultrasound. I think also if we um, bear in mind this particular photo and the large volume of clot contained within the hematocele, it makes logical sense to evacuate this and um, speed up that patient's recovery. <clears throat> At the time of scrotal expiration, you may have findings similar to this where uh, the tunica albuginea is completely split. There's extrusion of the seminiferous tubules and an intratesticular hematoma. The first step is to clear off the hematoma 
and to assess the viability of the seminiferous tubules beneath. Um, this um, testicular tissue in the photograph above doesn't appear particularly viable. However, this was a patient who had a bilateral testicular injury, so it was important to salvage as much as much um, potentially viable tissue as possible. So we wrapped the testicle in warm gauze and this helped delineate the salvageable tissue a little bit better. And um, we were able to salvage a, a reasonable amount of testicular tissue for this patient. Two special cases discussed in the guidelines are penetrating scrotal trauma um, in which scrotal expiration is recommended with debridement of non-viable tissue. And the aim is to perform a primary reconstruction of the testes and the scrotum. Sometimes um, closure of the tunica albuginia can be difficult, particularly if there's loss of some of the tunica um, and also if there's edema to the seminiferous tubules themselves. Um, in these cases, a tunica vaginalis flap can be useful to obtain closure. Obviously, if the testis isn't salvageable, an orchidectomy is performed. Um, testicular dislocation is rare. It's usually seen in the context of motor vehicle accidents, and the testis should be manipulated back into the scrotum and a plan for a secondary orchidopexy. Obviously, if manipulation is unsuccessful, then a primary orchidopexy is performed. The long-term outcomes from testicular injury um, can be divided into its impact on fertility and its impact on endocrine function. Obviously, if there is a significant loss of testicular tissue, that can lead to a decrease in sperm parameters and also a decrease in testosterone production. And then in addition to this, there is a theory that a breach of the blood testes barrier can lead to the production of anti-sperm antibodies um, due to exposure of the immune system to tubular antigens. This, however, hasn't been proven in practice. Um, there's a, a dart of um, data surrounding the outcomes um, because testicular trauma is a fairly rare injury and most of our studies are limited to small retrospective case series. Within these case series, not all injuries are equal in severity, so it can be difficult to draw comparisons. Often there's no measure of fertility or hormonal status prior to the injury. And also you must consider the fertility or hormonal uh, potential of the contralateral uninjured testes and also the fertility potential of this patient's partner. Fertility threatening testicular injuries are considered to be rare with notable exceptions um, if there's a bilateral injury, bilateral avulsion or injury um, in a solitary testes. If there's a large volume of tissue loss anticipated, it's really important to discuss the potential impact on fertility and endocrine function with the patient. Uh, semen cryopreservation um, can be difficult to obtain prior to surgery, but can be arranged for the days following surgery. Emergency TZ is another option, but obviously this is center dependent because you'll need access, uh, immediate access to an andrology lab. And in the case of avulsion, microvascular replantation is an option, but again, um, it has to occur in a center with specialist expertise. Um, most of our data is limited, as I say, to, um, to small case series. And um, this is one such series um, from the University Hospital of Split of seven patients who had a testicular rupture repaired. All had normal spermia six months following their injury and none had anti-sperm antibodies. Uh, the largest series in this area is actually um, involving 80 rats that were divided um, into eight groups with one control group and seven groups um, where the rats sustained a unilateral testicular injury, which was managed um, with immediate orchidectomy, repair um, or conservative management. You can see from the table on the right that the fertility was impaired, regardless of whether the testes was repaired or, um, or conservatively managed. Um, however, immediate orchidectomy did appear to restore fertility rates to control levels, which uh, perhaps suggests something to do with anti-sperm antibodies. Um, given the dart of data um, surrounding um, functional outcomes after testicular injury, um, we can try and extrapolate from other areas such as long-term follow-up after testicular torsion. Um, this is a, a nice paper from this month's Journal of Clinical Medicine, um, which looked at 49 patients who underwent surgery for suspected testicular torsion. 
Um, 87% of these patients had normal zoospermia, uh, 10% developed oligozoospermia, and one patient had asthenozoospermia. 10 patients in the group had fathered a child after testicular torsion and assisted reproduction was not needed in any of these cases. And the same study also looked at endocrine outcomes and they noted that patients after orchidectomy had elevated FSH and LH um, and a lower testosterone and free testosterone levels compared with uh, cases where the testis was preserved. Um, we can also look at data from patients undergoing orchidectomy following stage one testicular cancer. Um, this is a study involving 75 patients with a five-year follow-up and 11% initiated testosterone substitution. Uh, for the remainder, the LH remained approximately 150% of expected age match control levels, and the total testosterone was 15% lower than expected. So I think this in the previous study um, shows that loss of testicular tissue can lead to a reduction in uh, total testosterone, and perhaps um, we need to consider measuring testosterone in these patients and uh, um, offering supplementation where required. <clears throat> uh, the final thing I'd like to discuss is, um, can uh, testicular rupture be managed conservatively, um, much in the same way that we manage our, our renal injuries conservatively? Um, there are a number of case series that suggest it can, and although it contravenes our current EAU guidelines, I think it is something that possibly can be considered if the patient is very comfortable and if the rupture is quite small. Um, this is a, a case series of a patient who presented six weeks following a testicular injury, and um, the surgeons explored this patient and were surprised to note that um, the area over the seminiferous tubules had uh, re-epithelialized in the intervening weeks, so there was no repair required. Um, this is an ultrasound from one of my own patients who um, had a delayed presentation following a testicular injury. He had a, a small testicular rupture, was quite comfortable, and um, we discussed conservative management with him. This is his ultrasound three months following the injury, and you can see um, that the, the testicle has repaired in the intervening time. So in conclusion, testicular trauma is relatively uncommon. And the indications for expiration would be a rupture or a large hematocele greater than three times the size of the contralateral testes. A fertility or endocrine threatening injury is rare, but it must be considered in cases of large volume loss, such as bilateral trauma um, or trauma in a solitary testes. And in the future, perhaps we may be uh, managing these small ruptures conservatively. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, wonderful update in, in the testicular trauma. I don't know if uh, any questions are coming from the audience. Uh, uh, do, do we know if we have any questions coming from the audience? If not, I will be, I have a couple of them. I have a, a very a simple question that it's a simple, but it's, I think it is important. It is a, to Dr. Redmond about testicular trauma. When a patient is suffering a testicular trauma, a, do you consider if you are doing a, an orchiectomy a, in the emergency room to implant a, a testicular prosthesis? Or do you think it is absolutely contraindicated since in the majority of the scenarios you are working through the scrotal skin and then uh, it can be extruded or, or infected. Which one? Uh, I would, I would um, avoid putting in an implant in the emergent setting for the reasons that you outlined. Um, and I, I would discuss it with the patient afterwards. You know, many patients actually opt not to proceed with an implant anyway. I think it's, um, you know, a, a smaller group of patients and it's better to avoid the risk of extrusion or infection like you've mentioned. And for, for our knowledge, uh, because I don't know if the patient is suffering a bilateral trauma and you are uh, uh, very afraid about the fertility in the future of the patient, how long can you preserve uh, the tissue to, to, to take it to cryopreservation, to test it? Do you know it? Because I don't know it exactly. Do you know it? 
Um, it, do you mean in, in relation to obtaining a semen sample? Um, it's usually within the first two or three days, but obviously the earlier you can um, obtain a sample, the better. Um, often when the patient presents initially, they're in so much pain, it could be quite difficult to get a sample, but uh, as soon as possible is the answer really. Thank you. Dr. Georgievic, uh, yes, for you, um, uh, uh, from your lecture, my, my thing is that you prefer to work afterwards uh, when you have an acute uh, acute uh, amputation of the penile because you think later you can do a better job because if you work in the in the acute phase, the results are not so good. Is is that correct? Yes, it is correct because you never know where will be a total penal amputation. Maybe in a some small in a some small place at the end of the world that it is not possible to do um, uh, re replantation immediately. You know, so a majority of cases finish definitely uh, as a postpone, uh, in postponed surgery. So we usually have a result after a total amputation, and then we are going then to discuss what is the best option and to offer the best techniques with a, a good results after. To that. Thank you. Uh, and uh, my last question, I'm very quick because we are almost out of time. Uh, Eduard, uh, in which patients are you going to have a conservative management of a penile trauma? Maybe I would consider that in a Peyronie fracture, very small, but what, you know, going through the uh, Going through the literature, I would recommend to do surgery unless there's something uh, very specific uh, uh, situation in a patient involving Peyronie treatment, but I, I would advocate for surgery. Okay, thank you very much. So I think uh, we have a couple of questions. I don't know if we have time. I would like to know uh, coming from uh, uh, from the European Medical Association, is it possible to, uh, we have some time. So uh, there is a question for Dr. Georgievic and it says, is there any significant differences in the patient's sexual function among selected flaps or the recovery of sexual function is influenced by other reasons during the procedure? Well, sexual function uh, is um, uh, depends, uh, of course, uh, of um, of uh, restoration of the of the neurovascular bundle nerves after penal trauma, definitely. And there is a big difference if we discuss about sexual fun uh, function in a, a population in a young and older population who had some type of penal trauma. So um, I would like to add, I would like to add to Eduardo also that um, uh, there is a difference, and I usually recommend uh, uh, treatment, immediate treatment of penal fracture in a younger uh, in a younger man who had a, a fracture during a sexual intercourse especially if it is um, if it is um, uh, joined with a urethral trauma but in older like uh, after uh, during a, as a peyronie disease and then we always have a time to try to find the best option to to make a grafting and to correct the, the, the to correct the deformity or maybe to continue with the insertion of uh, penal prosthesis there is uh, one question for Dr. Redmond, and uh, it's asking which suture do you prefer for, uh, to do the restoration of the albuginia of the testes? I, I usually use Vicryl, and it depends on the size of the testicle, maybe a 3 or 4 or Vicryl. And uh, one more for Dr. Garcia. Uh, what about the curvature? Do you do dorsal tack at the same time? Dorsal what, sorry? Dorsal tack at the same time. If you are doing any, just, what do you mean by dorsal tack? The question I I do understand the question is that if the patient has a curvature, if you are doing anything with it during the penile trauma, I do understand it like that. I don't know. Something like application, maybe. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. thing is that well, I I haven't I haven't thought about that, but uh, I would hesitate to do any uh, any plicature in an acute uh, penile fracture, not not because I'm worried about the, the result, but because I'm worried about uh, the preference of the patient. As you know, if you do 
uh, uh, an aggressive plicature and the, the gentleman loses some uh, some length of the penis, it might not be what he preferred. So I would I would hesitate to to answer to answer yes. Yes, I think that in that scenario, it is a really important common sense and that it depends on what you are seeing in the operating room, because it depends on the severity, on the hole you have in the albuginia, in the kind of uh, peyronie's disease the patient is suffering, if it is calcified, not the age, the erectile function, I think uh, there are so many things together that is really difficult to make a, a decision and to answer a question like that, but uh, I think uh, in the operating room, in the emergency room, for the majority of us, the end point should be just to treat the, the defect in the albuginia, trying not to mm -hmm. worsen, and then we will see how is everything uh, going on. So uh, I think uh, we are uh, running out of time. So I would like uh, to thank you to the European School of Urology and to the SGURS and all of you for your time, for your a wonderful presentation. I think it has been really didactic and I think it is really important to speak about uh, these uh, very, very rare conditions and uh, scenarios that uh, I think uh, will help uh, too many of us. So thank you very much to all of you and uh, let's uh, try to see uh, soon and to enjoy some time together. And I am looking forward to share some time with you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.